Okay, I'd like to uh, speak words of praise for somebody that I love dearly. In all due respect to my wife and my children and my family and my Tzibor and my Chabor here and all my friends, I, I say this, I thought about it often. I've met a lot of people in this world. And I've traveled around from the four corners of the earth and seen a lot of spectacular men, a lot of famous five-star people. And I'm not saying it's just because we're saying Divrei Shvach for my friend and our friend today. But I think that Eliyahu Law may be the greatest person I ever met. And that he was unique. He was a one-of-a-kind, but different than a one. It's a one-of-a-kind that was one-of-a-kind that was number one in the universe. I got to start off with a joke, of course, and I'm sure that the men in Irvine have never heard this joke before. But did you hear about the horse that went into the bar and walked up to the bar and says, "Give me a scotch and soda"? And the bartender said, "Why the long face?" <laughs> Eliyahu would be rolling, on, right? You never heard that, right? You see that? You're glad you came today, <laughs> right? He could be sitting and rolling on the floor. If you told him a hundred times, he'd be sitting and rolling on the floor laughing at that joke. He'd never stop. But it would be uncontrollable. Tears would be rolling out of his eyes, right? I have Aaron, right? Harry's here, and you can all testify. Everybody can. Eliyahu was truly unique. Eliyahu had qualities of, of no man I ever met in many, many ways. I really think that maybe it was really not Eliyahu law, but Eliyahu Navi that came to visit us here. Yeah. He just, I don't know, to the day that he walked in, I went on vacation for two years and a quarter or two years and a half. And from the day that he passed on, that era of Shabbos, I, got to, I had to go back to work. Because he didn't let me do anything. I've never had a better friend in my life, and I had a lot of good friends sitting in this room with me. Dear, dear, close and wonderful, dedicated friends. I never, ever had anybody like him enter into my life. I knew what it was to be a selfless servant. He taught me that. At the expense of, of tremendous suffering on his part, as we know, he was in tremendous pain all the time. But never ever heard the man complain. All it was, I mean, here's a man that was really, truly suffering. I couldn't have taken it. None of us could have, probably. And yet I was feeling fine and wonderful going to do something, and our beloved Eliyahu would come on and say, You can't do that, Rabbi. I'm taking care of us. He says, Eliyahu, you can hardly walk. And like Rev Graham brought out, he was somebody that wouldn't sleep because a principal wouldn't go to the Arab market here to get the hardware part and walked all the way to Makni Yehuda right, to get something for a principal. I said, I'll go over there. I'll jump on the train. No, I'm going. For those two and a half years that he was here, I hardly was able to do anything because he'd always step in and take the job away and make sure it got done. Eliyahu, as it was mentioned, was a perfectionist. I could speak for hours of him. I'm not going to, but I could, because there's so much greatness about him. He was a true perfectionist. I tell with the greatest love and affection from him a story from David Chernin, who was a property manager, real estate manager here in Yerushalayim. David Chernin to this day said, there's never been a greater man to take care and fix his apartments and clean his apartments in Eliyahu Law, without any doubt. But I gotta tell you a story. That he would call Eliyahu and says, I need an apartment clean. And the people are coming on Wednesday at 12 o'clock and it has to be spotless. And Eliyahu would go over there on Tuesday morning to start cleaning it. And Dovin didn't think anything about it. He knew Eliyahu was a great cleaner. The problem was at 12 o'clock, when those people got there, the dirty dishes were still in the sink. The beds were not made, but that room that Eliyahu took to clean up and get right for those people coming was perfect. And David would say, nobody could ever clean a room like that. But he didn't, he didn't care. So what if the people would come? You can't give a people a room that's not right. This room had to be clean. And that was Eliyahu's character. When he did something, he did it right, as Rev. Graham mentioned. It was nothing that was half done. It was done completely with a full heart and with love and he couldn't see doing something. If it wasn't done right, then don't do it. 
even at the expense that you have this family that just came from America with their 30 bags and their 15 children, and they're standing at the door, and the place is a mess, except for that one room that he did, which is absolutely beautiful. Eliyahu called up this yeshiva. He was with his good friend and our good friend, Sivia. He'd been in touch with her. They'd been looking all over for a place for Eliyahu to go to yeshiva. And nobody wanted him. God, but they only knew what they gave up. They, nobody wanted to take him. And he called me on the phone. He was on the phone with me probably less than a minute. I said, you found your home. Come on over. You're moving in. This from our minutes conversation probably that happened. Right? And he moved in here and he never turned around and looked back. He took over the place in every way that he possibly could. With quality and with love. I want to tell a couple of stories that really show a lot who it is. First of all, this may have come out of Irvine that I heard this. Or somebody from him in America said this word. But the word was, they said, I said that Eliyahu fulfills the perkyavos, right? What's yours is yours and what's mine is yours. And then somebody said to me, we have one line to add. What's yours is yours, and what's mine is yours, but your pain is mine, and your difficulties are mine. Eliyahu did not let have a person have those things if he could help it. If he could take it away, he took it away. That's who he was. He cared about everybody, and about every detail of their life. And he tried to do everything for everybody all the time in every way that he possibly could. He did a job that Rabbi Weiss tried to get done for years in fixing his house. That thing was done. And again, like it was mentioned, he could hardly walk. He could hardly, his, his pain was extreme. It was snowing out and he's on the roof fixing the roof. He didn't know not to do things what had to be done. This is big. Eliyahu, so, he, Eliyahu was a man of very strong beliefs, by the way. He was not a weak man. He believed what he believed. But he would come and I would tell him something, right? When it comes to halacha or somebody in the yeshiva, one of the rabbis would tell him something. And he'd say, this is his words now. He says, I don't feel that's right. I don't, I don't believe that's, that's, that's just. But if that's Torah, then I'll do it. And that happened many times with me. When he said, I hear that. You told me that, so that's what the Mishnah Ruhu says. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. i got to do it, I'm going to do it. But I don't believe it, and I don't think it's right. But if it was the Torah, he wouldn't turn against it. He bent himself. One time we were talking, and we'll talk about this at the end in a few minutes, about what a project I'd like to suggest for, to, to uh, memorialize him. I talked about having a nice near Tommy on the Aaron Kodesh in the yeshiva. And Eliyahu says, I got an idea for it. Well, you know, if Eliyahu had an idea for it, he didn't just draw a little sketch of a near Tommy. He drew an engineering drawing of the near Tommy with every detail and every screw in it. I'm literally how big the bolt holes were and where the bolts went and everything about it, what colors they were, what lights were in it. The whole thing, a complete drawing. And he gave it to me, and I'm telling you, he put his heart into it. I said, it, was, it went on for almost a week, and I said, Eliyahu, the yeshiva has a lot of other business to take care of, please. And he said to me, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. And he spent almost a week making this mechanical drawing of this near Tommy that he would like to see here. And I said to him, Eliyahu, he gave it to me, I said, Kala, kavod for what you did, but this is not what I or we are looking for. He looked at me, he says, you sure? I says, positive. And he threw it away and he just went back to doing his work. He was able to bend at that level. If you'd done that to me, I would have been broken. I would have been crying in the corner for a week that somebody told you, I did all that work and that's the way you say? He says, that's what it does. You don't think that's what the Shiva needs, Rabbi? Go, finish, next project. He was mavato to the point of, he gave, he, he was literally... He did everything he could to please everybody, but not in a, in, a, in a negative way, in a positive way, to be a servant to everybody that I saw him with and knew him with. Right? When the money came for the yeshiva, by the way, it was mentioned that he didn't have any money. Talked about going to work. How can I go to work? 
If that man got a dollar, that dollar came to the yeshiva and he lived here poor. He did not have, he did not ask, and anything that he got in, no matter where it came from, immediately it went to keep the yeshiva open and to keep it going and take care of the needs. And the people in the neighborhood knew there's a family here that's a widow, and he went over there every Shabbos and cooked the meals for them so that they'd have the chicken because they liked it in a particular way. And he didn't just, there were two people, a woman and her daughter. He didn't cook for just them. They had enough food for the whole week when he got done. And he made sure he went out and got the chickens for them and cooked everything for them. At my house, when he came over and we finished eating on Friday night or Shabbos day or third meal, whenever it was, we'd all go to sleep. All the dishes were in the sink. All the dishes were on the table. And guess what? When you woke up in the morning, there wasn't a dish or a fork or a spoon in a sink or on the counter. Everything was put away where it belonged. And I'd get up at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning to go daven at the Nate's Minion. Eliyahu was finishing off, drying the things off and putting them away. And then he'd go home to sleep. Until the last days when he was in tremendous pain and we got the expanders for his leg to help his circulation, I don't remember Eliyahu getting into bed. I come in in the morning and there's Eliyahu in the office, leaning back in our office chairs that we have here for the executives, snoring away. I said, when are you going to sleep? Two, three days, he'd be up in a row. And then he'd fall asleep in the chair. I never was in his roommate, but I, I didn't see him going to bed very house. often. He wasn't in house. He never went into the bedroom. He slept in his chair. And what was he doing all night? Working on a computer program for the yeshiva, figuring something out for the yeshiva, helping somebody else that needed a helping hand. A servant, an Evid Hashem, an Evid Eklai Yisrael at an unbelievable level. Unequal. I learned more from that man than any rabbi I ever learned from, or anybody probably. In terms of Midos Tovos and Derek Eretz for people, a peacemaker, there were people I could, I had problems sometimes, I couldn't talk to somebody. So just leave it to me, go talk to him. Suddenly the person would come back as a friend. Somebody I was having a fight with. I don't know how he did it. He had a way with people. He had a way of understanding the ways of the world. His history and his background, we learned a little bit more tonight from his brother, from Harry. But he was, he was unique in that way, the things that he touched. So I thought I did a lot of things in my life. He, he put me to shame. I want to make sure. Again, the stories that we can tell, and everybody here in this room has them. I don't think I've ever seen anybody that's been has come to the yeshiva, and there have been many great men here, wonderful people. The place is in Makam Torah. It's a it's a community. It it's, it provides so much for this community with the classes and the people that are here. And as Rev. Citrin mentioned, right, a couple of those last week, I think, that you mentioned that, since everybody comes here, feels comfortable. It's a place that we, we're not, we don't have all these restrictions on people. You come here to learn Torah, come learn Torah, whether it's for five minutes or five hours or five days. And when you come in, we don't care what kind of hat you're wearing, you got to be sneers. You don't care what kind of hat or pants or shoes you're wearing or what outfit you're wearing or your Rebbe is. He came here to learn Torah and be with your fellow Jews to grow closer to God. And Eliyahu was the perfect vehicle to facilitate that for everybody that came here. He judged nobody. And like it was said, if he didn't like somebody, he didn't care for somebody, they never knew it. I found out once that there was somebody he couldn't stand. And I had never seen him being nice to that. He was that nice to that person all the time. I had no hint. He said, I don't like that guy. <laughs> Not that he didn't love him. He loved him. Like, Ronnie, I'm sorry, I don't want to say your name in public. <laughs> he, he, it's, he loved him. Like someone said to me last week, I think it was Rabbi Nachman Kahana said to me when we were walking out of shul last week, he says, you've got to love every Jew, but you don't have to like them all. Right? So that was Eliyahu, right? He loved every Jew, but if he didn't like you, you didn't know it, because you were sure that he loved you more than anybody else in the world. My kids... My wife, my children, my grandchildren, they, 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 they yearned to be around Eliyahu. When they heard he was coming, they came into town just to be with him. 
when he was going to be a guest at the house. They loved being with him so much. I was thinking, if in, in putting myself in Eliyahu's head, what would Eliyahu want now? And this is the end of his first year your site. I thought about the following thing. I'd like to put it out to the community. I'd like to put it out to his friends in Irvine. I'd like to put it out to the people. First of all, I forgot one thing. I'd like to thank Mama Law for bringing Eliyahu and, and Harry and the family into the world. I hope she enjoys this video of, of her son and hears how special he really was. She knows, but I'm sure every mother loves to hear that about her child. And I hope his brother and sister in America will also have this video, and we thank you for being part of us through Eliyahu, right? And we hope we'll get to meet all of you at some point. We're very, very glad to have Aaron Harry here. Aaron's his Hebrew name. Right? It's just such a pleasure. It's such a treat for us. And that when he said that, he says, I'm low maintenance. Well, there was nobody low ma more low maintenance than our Eliyahu, you know? Eliyahu could sleep on a bed of nails and, you know, he'd say, what a nice bed you gave me. Why are you being so good to me? <laughs> he just, he, he had, just his needs were so minimal. So I thought, I thought what he would want, and I'm saying this from the depth of my heart, and I thought about it a lot. The first thing that Eliyahu would want was this yeshiva to remain open. That's who he wanted, to remain open. Because he knew there was a place that somebody like him could come can't believe nobody else wanted him. A jewel like this. But it was different. He wasn't like the run of the no kind of person. In so many places, not that I'm not knocking anybody. Everybody picks their people, but this place is a place for people. And Eliyahu understood that every man that walked in that door, if he wasn't a complete outrageous nut, was welcome here and he had a place and he found a home and he found a community. And Eliyahu loved that about the yeshiva. I also want to mention to you that Eliyahu, my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Goldstein, Zikon Sadek HaDash talked about what's the definition of a Ben Torah, a Talmud HaKam. Not a Talmud let's leave it at a Ben Torah. A Ben Torah wasn't meant that you learn Yom Velayla and you didn't stop learning. But it meant that when you weren't doing something that had to be done, you went back to learning. And Eliyahu learned round the clock, and most people don't know that. If he wasn't working, he was learning. He had a seder with a friam in the middle of the night. He had a seder with this person another time. He had sedurin that he made for himself. If he was doing work for the yeshiva, he was totally dedicated to doing that work. But when he didn't have something to do those spare moments, he was a ben Torah. He learned and learned and learned. And he was hungry. He read whole books, he'd tell me. He finished whole books. That's what he'd be sitting in the chair all night for instead of going to bed. So I thought one of the things that Eliyahu would very much want, and I know this for a fact, he wants this place to remain open for a long time, to be here for people such as us and himself. Anybody, we're not selective, as long as a person is Jewish and has a desire to learn. We specialize and we started off starting for as we call the mature and motivated. But that's not our boundary. Our boundaries are Jews that are looking to study Torah, looking for a place they feel comfortable and they're accepted. And they don't have all these boundaries. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. All you've got to do is come here and learn and not be too distracting and you're welcome. He would want that. The second thing I think he would say is, I don't want any attention. I don't want any recognition. There I'm going to disagree with Eliyahu Hulu. And I'd like to suggest the following. That is a community here and in Irvine and all his friends in the world, I'd like to say, we're setting up now, as the yeshiva, right, a separate fund and account, right, to keep track of trying to create a memorial for Eliyahu Hulu. Eliel Zaman Law, with three things. One, to create a fund that will be able to create and have built in his memory an Aaron HaKodesh for our, right now we have the Sifrei Torah in a safe. We want to build the proper Aaron HaKodesh around the safe. Number one. And that Aaron HaKodesh represents what Eliel represented, the Ten Commandments, the written law, the, she, the, the Torah Shebik Sav. That was Eliyahu. Number two, the parochus, which weaves in and out. What's the word? It's, it waves in and out. It goes in and out. That's the oral law. It's oscillating. It's moving. It's changing. It's adaptable. That was Eliyahu. And we'd like to dedicate an, the, the, the parochus for the Aaron HaKodesh, the written law, by draping it and surrounding it as it is now protected by the oral law and defined by the oral law. That was Eliyahu. And finally, 
the Netami that he designed, right, that we talked about, to find the proper and dedicated Netami that gives cover to that man, to his shining and eternal light of Torah. And I remember I told this to Eliyahu, we talked about it when I was a kid. I was very, very alienated from being Jewish right after my bar mitzvah. And I didn't like the shul that I went to, and I didn't get involved, and I left. And I was very angry until I was 38 years old, and I came back and started working it out. But I told them one thing, and I tell everybody, that when I walked into that huge synagogue, which seated 3,000 people on the holidays in the five towns in New York, it was dark in the whole building. There wasn't a light anywhere. And when I opened the door of that base Knesset, of that huge auditorium, there was one thing that always struck me. That was the near Tommy was burning. It was the only light in the building. But it shone the light of Torah, and it always made me feel good that I could go up there and see that lamp burning. And I'd like to dedicate as the third part of the, of the triad for Eliyahu that we have a proper near Tommy hung over the Aaron HaKodesh, which we will build, and the parochus that we will build and have a near Tommy, which will be the light of Eliyahu. Hopefully it will continue to shine in our lives and illumine us and inspire us, his memory, to inspire us, right, to follow in his mitos and in his ways that he lived and he acted and he treated the people around him. Bein Adam Michavero, the love of a man for his fellow man, Eliyahu, was the epitome of how to do that. He wasn't perfect, but he worked on himself. And it showed. And this room of people and the room of people in Irvine and across the planet that he touched is incredible and unbelievable. And we would like to perpetuate that memory. And in part of that, part of Eliyahu's dream also, is to perpetuate the Shiva. So I'm making an offer right now. We're setting up an account to raise $36,000 to dedicate the Aaron Kodesh the Parochus and the Ne'er Tamid in Eliyahu's memory, and part of that money will be for about, come out to be when we're done, about one month's worth of expenses in the yeshiva that Eliyahu will be raising from the world above, right, to make sure that we stay open for one month. We want to stay open forever, we hope, as long as God wills it. But to do that, to split that, whatever money's raised, right, to create those three things and help the yeshiva to stay open and pay its expenses so that we can be here for other people like you and me and Eliyahu. Everybody who loved him, remembers him, cherishes him. This opportunity to think what we're doing right now. We're on opposite sides of the globe and we're sharing this experience. We may just see him together. How many miles? Irvine is 9,000 miles from here. And we made a seeum together and we said cottage together. And we thought and we remembered a man that was beyond great. He was a paradigm of what a human being should be. It was unfortunate he suffered so much, but I never, ever heard that man complain. Literally, he never said anything hurt. He never said why. He just went about doing what God willed him to do and accepted it with a smile. He had his problems, as has been talked about, and everybody goes through that. But in the long run, it was a man that's an inspiration that we should never forget, should always remember him, right? For this place, for sure, he's one of the fathers, for sure. One of the great granddaddies of Yeshiva Rebbe Akiva, because he gave us so much. And again, I hope that we will be able soon, when Reb Sinna comes, that we be able to get together and find a way to make an octus, a connection between Eliyahu's two families. We've made it with his blood family from both sides, with his two families of his spirituality in Irvine, California, and in Yerushalayim, Yer HaKodesh, to bring us together to share many, many years together in Torah, Mitzvah, and Maishim, Toivim. And this day, the yurt site of Eliyahu, Zalman, Ben Yisacha Halevi, his neshama should flow free into the world of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and David and Shlomo and the greats where he's sitting with them learning Torah, Yom Velayla, and shining the light and watching over us from the worlds above. May his memory be blessed eternally. May we never forget him. And thank you everybody for everything for today and for the whole year that we've been involved in memorializing him. We should only see Hatzlacha and Bracha. And thank you for coming today. And may Eliyahu be honored and glorified in the world. Shalom Aleichem. Amen. Rebsina, thank you. We'll be in touch, and we'll see you soon. Well, we'll
bless you. Thank you for sending us this way. Sending us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.